All right. Recording. Charlie. Wait, what? We were talking about Charlie. What were we saying about Charlie? I don't know. what We, we didn't yeah. record it and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You want to start us? You were saying that people don't know Charlie bit my finger. Charlie, that really hurts. That's right. Students right. don't know Charlie bit me, my finger. Yeah. It's, Charlie. It's, Charlie bit your finger? You, Char you bit his finger? No, 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 no. That's not what happened. <laughs> Yeah. Stan, you're doing a basics course. Yes, this is part of it. Wow, I get to be on the basics course. Yeah, multiple times. I you you probably don't remember because I started planning the basics course like four years ago. Yes, I remember. But you are also you've already agreed. Four years ago, you agreed to do another episode with me in the middle when I do the perspective section. Did I? Yes, you did. <laughs> in yes, writing? <laughs> um, maybe. And as an email. Yeah, it might have been. It might yeah, be no, email, yeah. Never mind. Or yeah. a text message. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we don't even need to check. Just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's not a whole lesson. It's like literally just going to be a conversation. Okay. Similar to this. It's a conversation about do we really see in two-point perspective? Mm. We actually had this conversation yes. four years ago, and I was like, let's recreate this conversation. Okay. That was great. Let's because do it. About how perspective is an invented thing. We don't actually see in one point, two point, three point. We see in like a much more like fisheye kind of curvilinear. What is it called? A profound truth. We do not see the way we teach perspective. Right. Not quite. It's well, close enough to it, look real. It's a trick that works. Yes. Anyway, thank you, you kind listeners, viewers, for purchasing the basics course. You get this exclusive episode of the <laughs> Pastor Podcast. Yeah. If you haven't heard of the podcast, go listen to it. One of the big reasons I wanted to put an episode of podcast into this mm -hmm. course is because I think our podcast is a very good base for a lot of students yes. not base for the skills but base in just a way to think about stuff as you become an artist yeah you've got a lot of conversations about fundamentals about yeah. how to like everything. structure your education all kinds everything of we have so many episodes yeah. that are gonna be good for people who are taking this course mm -hmm. and so i wanted to introduce everyone in this course to the podcast yeah well, we did. We've done 105 episodes, which That's many amazing. of them were aimed toward people who are beginners, people who don't know the landscape yet. Yeah. Yeah. Be nice if we could take out all the banter. Why? Yeah. You like have a no, wired wouldn't. down version of maybe That's the best part. Wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> okay. You know so how many... railing against the banter. Yeah. No, time. Marshall, do you, you don't understand. That's the best part. That's the whole reason people want to listen. They don't, ca they can get the information elsewhere. They can't get the friendships. <sighs> wow wow Dang. literally the reason our podcast is not boring is why you yawn <laughs> i always hoped it was for the content you don't even understand your own success oh no, i don't i don't i don't uh, understand it why don't you just write a book then let's just get started okay. let's just get going okay so this episode is gonna be general advice mm -hmm. for beginners okay go <laughs> i start this is your course. This I'll is be your, back in 45 minutes. Yeah, right. <laughs> your course in basics. Yeah. Stan, when you told me you were going to do a basics course, I felt like this is what the world needs. Because the, the first introduction to how you're going to get to be a good artist should be done by Stan. You've got empathy with your student. You'll make it simple. You'll make it fun. Marshall, you don't need to. They already bought it. But I'm not pitching it. I'm just telling I'm trying to be sincere here. If it's coming off as a sales pitch. It is. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I am trying to be sincere. Okay. I this don't is, need the compliments. I, okay, I'd like okay. to help the students now. Okay. Where do we go from here? Several sections I kind of want to, or general topics I want to cover here. So mm -hmm. one is habits to form habits to avoid common pitfalls mm -hmm. okay stan you're starting with habits to avoid sure let's start there okay when i started out i developed habits that i sure wish i would have avoided tell me which habits you have in mind that you are going to help people avoid at the beginning well, thank you for that perfect lead in yeah the, the very first habit is line quality uh, i want that i mean that's not one that i had i mm. because i had a good teacher that taught very good draftsmanship mm. yeah uh, and you wait did you, uh, are you trying to okay yeah so 
very early on in the course, pretty much the very beginning, I'm going to give people exercises to develop good line quality. Mm -hmm. And this is important, guys. Don't, don't skip these lessons just because it's lines and, you know, and don't just do it once and then go to the next lesson and think you can stop practicing all those warm-ups on good line quality. This is something you need to continuously work on and focus on is making your lines look good. And it does, that doesn't mean they have to be like, you don't have to think about every single line because then mm -hmm. that just makes them really mechanical. Mm -hmm. and you want to be expressive with it. You just want to develop the right speed and the way you hold the pencil and just the way you think about a line. You want to be able to notice when your lines are messy and then self-correct while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. That's the big part there is that you need to know what to look for. What is a messy line? What is a good line? And then just as you draw, you kind of steer yourself. Yes, it's it's a, a ability to control it and to know what kind of line I want to make. Yeah. And if I want to relinquish control and let go of it and make a messy line deliberately so that it's expressive, so that it's like a whale or like scat singing, that there's the ability to do that, but there's all the, so also the ability to control the thinness and thickness, the straightness and curvedness, the making it land where it wants to land, the aiming to a point. Those are things I did not learn. And years and years and even decades into it, wished I had. I became particularly sensitive to it when I did some drawings that demoed for a Proco video. And when you were critiquing it with me after we had you done the video me. and we talked together, you told me that you gave the line quality A and you paused and you said, ah, a C. Or maybe it was a yeah, C plus, fair. maybe it was a C that's minus. Fair. And I, oh, <laughs> a C. But it was because years and years of having not paid attention <laughs> to the quality of the line is like not paying attention to the quality of pronunciation of words. And I wish that I had spent more time working online. Anyway, yeah. I am glad you are going to be steering yes. students in the direction of paying attention to the quality of line. Yeah. And that is kind of hinting at the idea of being able to clearly say anything visually, not just with line. You also need to develop Clarity with value, clarity with edge, clarity with shape, shapes, clarity with color. Everything you do, you need to be able to speak clearly as well as be expressive and more chaotic when you choose to. Mm -hmm. But if you can't choose to be clear when that is required in your drawing, then you're always chaotic and then people don't understand what you're saying. Have you ever read Norman Juster's The Dot and the Line? It's a you little know. book. Do I read, Marshall? It's a little children's I, book. It's a book that has pictures, pictures on every page, Dan. <laughs> it's Marshall, do, I thought you knew me. It's made for you. It is. <laughs> wow. What is it? It's a picture book? It's the dot and oh the line. Oh, my God. <laughs> and rather than give it away, read the book. Look it up. Check yeah. it out. It I've been is, able to bond with my son so well because he's still, you know, mostly in picture book, oh. you know. But where there's like three words on each page. Like, I can read that. The dot and the line is a parable. It's a, it's a fable. It's the kind of thing that has a moral to the story. And it uh -huh. is about a dot who falls in love with a line because the line is so expressive. I won't tell you what happens from so there. It's not you a straight line. The it's, does the line change? Throughout the the, the book? less I tell you, can... the more that you will be riveted by oh where God. that story is going to go. This reminds me, last night, so Cooper, Cooper writes books. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Yeah, he, oh, sorry, he doesn't write. He illustrates them. Uh -huh. Then he staples the pages. Yeah. He brings it to me. He dictates it to me and I write on each page what yeah. he wanted to say. So yesterday he wrote a book about Alvin and the Chipmunks. But on the last page, he drew Alvin, Simon, Theodore, but as just single lines. They were just an indication of them in the background. They were just three lines, but three different colors. Were they recognizable? Blue, yeah, red, blue, and green. He didn't even say it yet. And I was like, is that Alvin, Simon, and Theodore back there? Wow. And he's like, yeah. Yeah. I was like, how? Like, he didn't even try to draw a person. He just like, he knew were they that he varying was... heights in the lines too? I got you. I don't remember. And he's yeah, not yet. He's five. He's five. Yeah. But he was already just using drawing to communicate a message. Yeah. He wasn't trying to like 
draw exactly what they look like. All he needed to do is get the message across. This is Alvin, this is Simon, this is Theodore, and they're right there. This is a quality that you hope training does not train out of an artist, is that ability to have the naive view. My son did a picture of me uh, when he was five. That was, it was part of a family portrait. And I could not believe when I looked at it how he caught my, my noodliness. And the, uh, there's a picture of me when I was about his age, maybe a little younger, that I found it and I thought, you put the two together and he, he caught a quality. But he had, he had no technical skill to speak of, but he had, an, uh, I think, an emotional response to the way you look that then comes out in the choices that he makes, primitive as they are. So yeah, that is a, a quality. Are you working in this basics course to not cure students of being able to see naively? This is mainly about learning how to speak the visual language. Okay. So giving them the, the grammar and the vocabulary mm -hmm. to be able to communicate what they want mm -hmm. through line, shape, value, edge. Well, yeah, that's something to keep in mind though, that when well, you can be trained with your vocabulary and your sentence structure, but it may be that what you have to say is just sort of pat. It's just what everybody else has said and it becomes cliche. Yeah. But that is, they are two separate disciplines. Uh, you can be really insightful with ideas and not have the skill to carry them through. You can hear wonderful music in your head, but not know how to play it. Or you can be a skilled musician that doesn't have musical ideas. So the awareness as you're training, that there is more than one skill to work on, more than one category of skills to work on even. How would you advise students to keep that naive exploration There's a few as things. they learn to draw? And as I give them these technical skills, you know, these rules, yeah. how do they keep some of that childhood spirit in them? Well, they are things that we've talked about in previous podcasts. One of them was the composition podcast, where we talked about doing reveries, where you don't follow any rules, you just mm -hmm. sit down for a period of time and you doodle and try things that you are not trying to make them impressive, you're just trying to make them interesting. They're, they're really just uh, what's going on in, in your impulses at the moment. Don't think about it. There is no subject. Just start doodling and exploring and seeing where it takes you. That's right. And this was one I did many years ago where I just, just yeah. brush strokes. And one leads to the next one. Yeah. Nice abstract. And then we did one that's cac we were, like the theme was like cactus. Something like and that. And then yeah, I think yeah. we listened to Roigsop. Yeah, yeah. Roigsop, yeah. right. I don't know. I don't know what. I think I ended up having this be the, the way to. Upside down, yeah. Uh, no. No. No, this is upside down. Oh, is it? I decided that this is the correct. Well, you, you have deemed it so, and therefore it is. <laughs> yes. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's. Before it allows you jump you... into the next thing, yeah. Um, there was uh, at Lightbox, Bryce Co. did a demo at our booth. Oh yeah, and we he showed did a that really one. cool thing where he was just splotching uh, water-based ink on the paper and letting the ink flow yeah. where it would, and then he would use that to uh, inspire him to draw around that and to use right. the contours of that. And you bought that? I did you? buy it. You... <laughs> yeah. Do you have? We'll show a picture of it, I guess, yeah. but. Yeah, it turned out really good. Yeah. Anyway, that, yeah, embrace, it's really em, fun. Embracing accidents and embracing impulses. Yeah. This is not a useless exercise. You, this is something people, I think artists should just keep doing all, all the, time. the time. Yeah. Not just to embrace that like childhood spirit, but also it allows you to work on just design skills. Mm -hmm. Like abstract shapes play a part in composition. Yes. Like you put a figure in your in your piece, that figure has to just look good next yeah. to all the other shapes. Yeah. Like it doesn't just have to look like a person. I would take it even further. I think that abstract shapes, values, angles, textures, abstracts are composition in the yeah. most important way. Imagery is also composition. Subject matter is composition, but subject matter is when you're studying composition, what you want to pay least amount of, of attention to, because it's so obvious. People will say, well, I like that picture because it's of a dog and I like dogs, or I don't like that picture because it's of a dog and I got bit by a dog. It doesn't have anything to do with whether it's a good picture or not. Yeah. But when you can obscure the subject matter. Or the emotion. And, not even see the subject matter, but yeah. just see the abstract pattern 
and respond to it emotionally. Hey, rather than talk about this, go watch the podcast we did on composition because mm -hmm. that's where we covered really the creativity part of picture making. Yeah. Composition is not about doing things correctly. It cannot be. If it is, then it's it's just repeating other people's compositions. Composition is about discovering new designs as you work that are solving the problems for the emotion you want this piece to have. And in a way, it's advanced. But in another way, it is primitive. It's one of the reasons why you don't need to teach small children to compose. Small children automatically compose by making one character bigger than another or smaller or more grotesque or they'll put more attention into one figure than another and it is all coming from emotional responses and so in a way composition is a combination of combining the the very primitive impulses with the knowledge now of what lines and shapes and values and textures and colors and knowing what warm and cool are, which a beginner that doesn't know what warm and cool is cannot compose yeah. with warm and cool color temperatures. But a person who knows what they are then can, they, can then decide, I'm going to warm up that character because I want them to feel as if they are a spot of warmth in a cold world. And yeah. then we're right back to childlike thinking using grown-up skills. So that, that could be a good way to balance out this basics course is to be thinking about is to, to watch that podcast and get ready for a course in that to follow up. One of the things you do in studying composition is to not just study composition. It's to do exercises. It's to play around. It's to do the thing that Charlie was mentioning is to use unpredictable media like what, what media you don't have any control when you put food coloring into a glass of water. You don't have any control what it's going to do. You can influence it by pushing it in one way or another. But it, there's a similar thing going on with wet media on a, a piece of watercolor board that if you've got a wet surface and you're putting watercolor into it, it's going to do more interesting, more fascinating things than we would be likely to do if we were pushing it around and forcing it. And so to start with that and to use that as some kind of inspiration, a lot of great artists do that. Justin Sweet likes to do that. He likes to start randomly and impulsively. Another thing that I would point toward would be, oh gosh, that, that, that book by Gabriel Rico on writing the natural way. She has so much in that book championing what childhood impulses do for creativity. And she's, she's rigorous with, when she was teaching, she uh, was, was rigorous with students about that you do need to learn your craft of writing. But you've also got to tap into the thing that makes you want to write in the first place. Most people do not want to write or draw because they just want to write or draw and have the technical skill. They usually have some thing they want to draw, some ideas that they've got. And so keeping an eye to that. Again, music, I think, is a very uh, uh, good thing. Why do you play an instrument? Just so that you can say, I played an instrument. I passed the test. Or do you have any real love of the music and even a real love of a style of music, which seems to be a driving force between, behind a lot of musicians? So keeping in mind which artists you like, and I say one more thing about it, uh, looking at your art parents and categorizing them into different kinds so that you don't say, I've got to draw just this way. Very important that you see that there are multiple ways to draw, some of them more heavy on technical things, some of them less, some of them more painterly, some of them more with lines, uh, some of them more like, like a grown-up drawing that looks like it's from the Russian academies, some of it that looks like what Shel Silverstein does in the children's books where he's got a crawling line that almost looks like a child did it. That, that primitive quality is something to be aware of and not to disdain. When you're learning to draw like a grown-up, don't disdain drawings that are like what children have done. Keep them uh, both in their proper places for reverence. Yeah, so you were talking about style mm -hmm. and looking at other artists and trying to replicate that. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I was going to mention that as a habit to like a thing to avoid potential pitfalls. I see students early on thinking about style. I understand. Well, I think I think you definitely I need to think about style. Yeah, eventually, and a little bit in the beginning too. 
it's great to have fun and try to copy artists you love, even when you are first starting. But one common pitfall there is to completely focus on style and to let it get in the way of learning fundamental concepts or principles. I agree. That have no style to them at all. They apply to all styles. Yeah. I see that all the time. And I saw it in a lot of my students that when I was teaching at, you know, at Watts Atelier because people would want to do it a specific way, but that's limiting. Yeah. They want to learn a technique. And it's like, well, no, what is behind that technique? What drives that technique? To, why does it work? Right? Like, well, what fundamental uh, principles did the person that invented that technique, what did they know? How did they make that work? That's what you need to learn. Not the style, the final style, yeah. the output that happened yeah. afterwards. Style is like dessert in a way. That, that way, and you see it in, in portfolios that people show you at conventions. When students come up and want to show their portfolio, oh, most of them have a style that they've self-consciously worked on. Most of them do not have the fundamental skills behind it. Most of them. Yeah. The awareness of what they're doing. In, in other words, a, a, a kid can imitate a grown-up and imitate their inflections and imitate the accent and imitate their mannerisms, but it does not mean that they have the skills to function in the world like a grown-up. And, right. and so the, to, there does come a point where I absolutely agree, there, a great deal of training is to forget about style. Because if you, if you forget about style and work on these things that strengthen your, your, your foundational skills, then as you adopt style and adapt style, you've got the ability to, some artists, some great artists can work in more than one style and it's because they know what they're doing. Yeah. Combining styles. Also, you can combine styles much better if you understand the things behind the style. You know, the elements of style. Yeah. In fact, that was, you know, that's the title of some books, Elements of Style, and it just turns, turns students off terrible because it sounds so academic. But if you really break down what it is, is you want to know style, you break down style into components the way cooks break down food into sugars and, and fats and, and uh, the, the different elements of cooking. So you are giving basics that are foundations in this course so that if a person dutifully attends to them, yes. they come out more skilled than if they had just jumped into copying a style. Right. I am also going to do master studies in this course. Okay. Yeah. Because I do, I think studying from other people is also important. The thing I'm saying is a common pitfall is to focus too much on the style and not enough on the fundamentals, but both are important. Yes. There's a balance. Well, we've made that point. You can say the same thing about just focusing on fundamentals and just be having no style whatsoever that is also one thing i see some personalities gravitate towards trying to do everything the right way yeah and if you think you're that kind of person you might want to push yourself to explore up you know some styles and break some rules every once in a while just so that you don't go five years of just academic exercises all the time yeah and then that just kind of becomes the way you do it yeah from that on and then it's going to be really difficult for you to be playful later always have little fun projects for yourself that are not the exercises that the teacher tells you to do in the class play a little bit yeah okay i want to bring up a topic that may be an aside scheduled creativity jams wow where do you if have to you've play been, some music, like specific jams, it's 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 a, it's a metaphor. It's jams is yeah, not literal music, but I want to make this jams. a thing. It could I be like could be response like, to music. It, jazz is or jazz is mostly like where people use the word jam, right? Uh, yeah, it, yeah, I, yeah, I okay. think it is associated with that. Yeah. So you have to listen to jazz music. You got to have peanut butter and jam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was not in our contract that you would do stuff like this. <laughs> This is why I did now, it. Now, uh, I wonder how many people are sitting there just like, oh. Oh, yeah, scheduled. just wincing. But scheduled creativity jams. Scheduled breakfast. Where to the person, 
I, I know what you're talking about. Students who work for five years on the fundamentals and they've lost their voice. They've lost their voice to the ability to do anything unique because everything is about getting my skills. And it, I don't think you can do five years of just fundamentals and not lose your voice. I think there needs to be yeah. exercise the right limb and the left limb somewhat in tandem so that you don't become imbalanced. And uh, uh, scheduled jams would be that we take time to do some stuff that experiments and even to do something with one month where you choose an art parent and for one month you work on that character's style, that artist's style. And then the following month, maybe two months, maybe three months, if you're really enjoying this particular artist, but not six months or a year. And then when you say, I've got a handle on this style, which you can in a few m months of working on it, choose something completely different and work on that. And you are put then in a position that is like that wicked learning thing that you're mm. going to have to figure this out. What episode is that? It's from the episode, How to Be a Good Student, season oh, two. Good. Well, Perfect. that yeah. is a great episode to listen to anyway. <laughs> season how two, to be a episode good 14. Yeah. How to Be a Good Student. Wicked learning is part of it. Go there. It's part of your basic training. Here's, how, here's how it was an aside, though. Yeah. Do you have any plans for that, where that weekly there is a, a gathering where you have different teachers each week, and they're going to give you their favorite creativity exercises? No, but I do want to bring in guest instructors occasionally. There, it's not going to be a, like a weekly thing like that, but occasionally sprinkle in. Like, you're going to be in the perspective one, yeah. obviously, because you've already verbally signed the contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. i've already recorded uh aaron blaze uh -huh. demo in one of the sections caesar santos recorded a little thing for one of the sections well we'll have several okay. others yeah okay here is why i'm asking is that i have been working with a group of students on perspective that i told you about it's only 12 students six month commitment we're over three months into it we meet for feedback once a week and we meet twice on Tuesdays for an hour each time just to do line exercises, just to do perspective exercises. What is an exercise? What do you mean? Give an me an example. Exercise is this. We put the timer on for three minutes okay. and you draw circles. Okay. Uh, you do them both counterclockwise and clockwise, big and small, and you try to make them circular. Okay. Three minutes. So that's turn it off. That's more of a shape exercise. Right? It's a shape yeah. exercise, but it is line quality. Yes. Right? And then we do squares and we try to make them square and right angled so they're proportioned proper and we do them clockwise and counterclockwise different mm -hmm. sizes different angles three minutes then we do the starburst of lines in all directions okay for seven minutes great and then we do ellipses and one of my students kyler griggs took this up and made an app that you can choose a 5, 10, 15, 45 degree, 60 degree ellipse, and it will show it, and you can make it at any angle, so you can make it oblate so where it's laying cheating. down. But no, no, he makes it so you can look at it, and then... <laughs> he doesn't even need to draw it. He just you, presses a button. You, <laughs> and you it makes draw it any from it, you and you say, this is a 20 degree ellipse. Oh, yeah. This is a 20 degree ellipse. And even if you aren't getting them right, you're imprinting the ellipses. Then we Wait, do... Wait, sorry, what does the app do? You, you, the app shows you the ellipse. They, and then you look at it and you draw the and same And you one? draw that ellipse. Okay. And I have And found is that to associate the number to the... the to the associate shape? the number, to do this them in 20. different directions, to do them at different angles. When I say different directions, I mean clockwise and counterclockwise. Yeah. Is there a number for the angle of the lips and how open it is? Yes. yes. What is that called? The openness of the, the eccentricity of the wow. ellipse is how open it is. Marshall. And then the angle of how it's tipped. <laughs> but Stan, <laughs> this has been, I mean, it sounds so technical and so boring. Yeah. I don't go this deep into perspective. I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm trying to only teach the intuitive part. Just just get it close enough to look good. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. Well, no. But I got to tell just you. Did. We just got to. It. Doing the technical exercises, because they are not so yeah. much intellectual as they are sensory. That you're learning to make a curve and trying to control the curve. I always feel more alive, more awake after we do these. Yeah. And then we do some, then we do some actual intellectual uh, puzzles. The plane game is what I call it, where you look at one 
plane of what will be a cube. In perspective. In perspective. Cool. And you've got to deduce what is the closest corner and you've got to do the other lines and then put the ellipses on it. And mm -hmm. Kyler worked out an app where you yeah, see just the plane, <laughs> then you see the finished cube, then you see the ellipses on it. Wow. And it is a puzzle. He even made yeah. it so that the angles on the planes... Uh, he just did this in the last few days. The angles on the planes will show you whether it's a 141 degree angle or a 110 degree angle or an 80 degree angle. Yeah. So it is like this Matt. ultimate one hour at a time. You are going to get this rigorous training in perception, but not just perception, uh, problem solving of where do I do the next set of lines? Which way will they aim? What will the proportions be? And it's like what you talked about with AI. It's not really giving you feedback. You give yourself feedback, but it shows you a problem to solve and then what the solution is. I think it's wonderful. Video lectures from Marshall at my website, martialart.com. So I call them warm-ups. Warm-ups. They're, they're exercises, yeah. but I call them warm-ups in my course uh, because I want them to do these exercises as a warm-up before they start drawing. Good. Every time you sit down to draw, just do a page of one of these exercises, Good. at least. If you want to do more than that, do 10 minutes of it, you could do a few pages. I introduce them to new warm-ups throughout the whole course to practice the new things that they're learning. Mm -hmm. So they start off with warm-ups for line quality, then for good shapes, then for value, control, then edges, all that. So same thing, but you're talking about actual jams of well, these exercises instead of just a warm-up that's pretty cool too i mean yeah but especially but, if it's with friends but and you let me carry, carry through with this have though. a whole peanut butter jam party with jazz music <laughs> i could improve your jam sessions so much if you just invite me i know that's why <laughs> i'm bringing up the topic is i would love to be a part of a weekly thing where the first half of it is technical warm-up because when you do these technical exercises, mm -hmm. you start to feel like, I'm strong, I'm strong, I can do this, I can make lines. Yeah. And then the next thing that happens is, what am I going to make lines for? And there becomes kind of a hunger of, I could draw right. pictures. And so you, the itch to create as a result of, I think, starting with technical warm-ups and then having a break and then come back and having uh, uh, creative puzzles or creative prompts, challenges... Uh, in fact, I'm even working with a friend who is putting together a whole list of potential creative prompts that could tap into. They've got five minutes to to play with these words, or, mm -hmm. like like you would give to AI, except you're giving it to an artist who's calling on their own. <laughs> it's funny how we have to go backwards now. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, like, you're calling on your own emotion, right? emotional responses. <laughs> it's as if you were giving it to a computer, but now instead, humans will drive. A real human <laughs> a will do it with. <laughs> blood in their veins and emotional responses like that is the original way marshall yeah, sure humans yeah. used to do this well i want to be part of something like yeah. this this does remind me the reason i have them do it before they start doing their longer drawing mm -hmm. is because they literally get warmed up yeah and that little the hunger the the you see you're getting better mm -hmm. even within that like 10 minutes you will, your hand will just start moving better. Your right. brain will go into drawing mode. And then when you start your drawing, you will do better. Mm -hmm. And you will kind of hit the ground running or your f initial result will immediately start right. a little bit higher quality because you're warmed up. Sometimes if you just kind of start drawing, you start messing up because you're not warmed up yet. And that demotivates you. It, it makes you feel like, oh man, I suck. I know. And that's just like a downhill spiral. You're just the whole few hours could end up just being bad because you started off making a few mistakes. But if you just start with warm-ups where there's like a bad circle is a bad circle, just do 20 more. That warms your hand and then you get better and it increases the odds that your whole drawing session will be better. Yeah. So. Stan, sincerely, this yeah. is not to sell anything because they've already bought the course. I wish, <laughs> I wish I had had this course when I was a teenager. I wish I'd have had it when I was in middle school. It Thanks. would have, it would have saved me so many years of trying to undo yeah. bad habits. Do you still have any of those? Or if you like, do I still have any bad habits? Them? What have you been doing to get over the bad habits you say you have? <laughs> 
these these line exercises oh, with my the, students. Oh, the jam that's, session. That is yes, that is one thing you I'm need doing. To make like a little logo and uh, intro. Yeah, a little jazz. Jam. A it, it splats on screen. A little jazz thing with some jazz. Yeah, Marshall's <laughs> jam session. <laughs> <laughs> I just got sing for that. Yeah, huh. this is great. Yeah. Okay. Good. You need to have like a weekly series. We we need to have a weekly series. No. Jam with Marshall or weekly. Marshall we don't need jam. to title it now. We can we can create later. Where's we've got we're students jamming here. right now? Oh, that's right. We are okay. So I should be Marshall getting in the spirit preserves. of it. Marshall preserves. Marshall preserves. A tobaluba shuba shuba nuba haba laba double double d. Marshall preserves. No. <laughs> It's got connotations. <laughs> He's already kinda... dead. Let's preserve him. <laughs> Marshall's preserves. <laughs> I wasn't even going for that. No, I know you weren't thinking that, but that's the connotation to an old guy. What next? Oh, God. Well, this seems like uh, the beginning of a totally new topic now. Where do we want? It could be. Okay. Let's talk about what problems they should expect. Mm. Okay. Because there's habits to avoid. So, things you... You might run into if you do the wrong thing, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and you, if you notice yourself doing it, try to avoid it. But then there's things that beginner artists will just run into. And it's like, this is expected. You're just going to have to deal with this. Well, I can think of the main one. Which, which is that? Not getting good fast enough. That's one of the main ones. I've been working on this for a month. <laughs> That's what you months. sound like. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's inevitable. But some people do have very quick trajectories yeah. to where they get good at things. And so other people see that and say, I'm not talented. But if it's any consolation to you, some of the people I've seen that have become the best artists I know are ones who were slow beginners. And there may be a reason that it's, it, you've got really good Mine material that it takes a long time to get it into that brain. Mine was similar to that. And that mm -hmm. is comparing yourselves to professionals that have been doing it yeah. for the past 20 30 years because that's what we see when you go on instagram and you follow artists that are good that's your feed yep that's your news feed right there and that's what you compare yourself to but with those few hundred awesome artists you follow there are millions literally millions of artists that are not that good mhm mm that kind of puts things into perspective. Like you can't just compare yourself to the top point, point, or yeah, point, 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 one percent. Yeah. <laughs> That's not how you say math. <laughs> Three points. Yeah. You don't compare yourself to the point zero zero one percent of artists because that is just a guaranteed way to, to see that you suck. To get discouraged. Yeah. yeah. And almost everybody does. You, there's no way you cannot get discouraged when you look at it as something that you should have now. Yeah. Imposter syndrome, we've talked about it many times. Many times. Because so many students ask us about it. Yeah. So, you kind of have to expect it. You have to expect feeling frustrated, not being satisfied with your work, which is a good thing. If you were satisfied with you yourself and your skill level, you have you would have no motivation to improve. Yeah. Stop growing. Don't look at that self criticism as a bad thing. Like, oh no, I suck. I'm so bad. Oh, I don't even. I can't even mentally be happy with myself. It's like a cycle. Like you notice that you're being self critical, mm -hmm. so then you think that you're unhealthy mentally, mm -hmm. and then you think, oh my god, I have a problem. I'll never be an artist. I'll never have the confidence. And it just keeps going and you just have, you think you have all these problems. It's like, no, you're normal. Yeah. You're not satisfied with where you are, which is why you're studying and why you're practicing. Right. So, noticing that you need to improve on something is just a, it just means you have an eye. You understand, yeah. you can see problems. That's good. It's sensitivity. Yeah. If you couldn't see your own problems, you'd never be able to improve. I've known of some students who cannot see their own, but they think they're good right from the beginning and everything they do is good and they never get better. Yeah. But yeah, sensitivity means pain. It's pain. And pain is inevitable. And that's the, that is the main thing I would say to, to a beginner that is saying, I'm, I'm in this for a relatively long haul. I'm not going to just do it for a week and then give it up, is that don't expect to leap into mastery quickly. 
And, and if you love it, if you enjoy it, mastery is going to happen easier because you're, you're doing it for the sake of enjoying The great irony is that when you do it for the joy of it, but you care about the, pro, uh, the, the quality too, you can do it for the joy of it and not care about the quality and you don't grow. But if you do it for the joy of it and you care about the quality, you've got this automatic cheerleader and critic going on that keeps you from falling over to being too easily satisfied and too critical. And then you're going to keep moving forward. And then seems like it seems like leaps like like uh, like George Leonard in his book uh, Mastery that I like so much. The leaps happen when you're not expecting them. They happen because you've been on this on this curriculum. You've been in this uh, work, and then eventually you come up to the next level, and it's like I wasn't even looking for it. Yeah, when you're looking for it, it seldom happens. It usually happens when really? you when you're when you're looking for growth. Well, let's talk about that. Go ahead. I've heard that having very specific small goals makes it more achievable. Oh, okay. I see what is you're saying. Is there a difference here? Yeah, there is a difference. Okay, I think. What, can you? Explain uh, but what I think I think what you are saying is is the solution to this is that when we're talk I'm talking about mastery. Okay. When you're when you're getting mastered, oh, mastery, where you're re- really then. saying, "Yeah, I am really good at this," that's going to take a long time. But yeah, you okay. can say that in a week, I can learn the difference between an oval and an ellipse. Right. In a week, I can learn the difference between a a line that is is uh, uh, consistent and one that goes thin to thick, yeah. and get some skill with it because those are chunking down to small enough bits, as Daniel Coyle and Talcott yeah, mentioned. Yeah, small achievable goals. Right. Keep your motivation up because if you say I want to be a master, mm-hmm. and you just start working towards becoming a master, whatever that means, you're not going to get there, and you'll get discouraged, mm-hmm. and you're just going to mindlessly start like shooting for something. What does that even mean? But if you have an achievable thing that you can get to in a, a few weeks, yeah. then you'll get there and you'll feel good about yourself and be like, on to the next thing. And you'll feel strong. Like, I did this. It's like going to the gym and working out. There's pain. Every single time you lift, your muscles break. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and there's you do. pain. It's the same with learning to draw. There will be pain, but you embrace it. You learn to love the pain because you know what happens right after that. You get better. The episode we did on the talent code is uh, that I am so sold on that book after that second reading uh, because he sort of prescribes all this stuff we're talking about with his research, but he does not give you specific exercises for how to draw. The talent code by Daniel Coyle, which we did an episode on. Charlie, if you can show what that one is, that is another, I know this is becoming an advertisement for all of our, our different podcasts, but that is, that is worth a fortune for a beginner who wants to know how am I going to get good and he's going to show you uh, s- specific techniques for how people get good but not specific techniques for how to draw. That's what this course is about. Pain leads to growth and once you start associating pain with growth you actually start to enjoy the pain yeah. because it leads to a positive thing. That's right. Feel so, the burn. Feel the burn. Yeah. Yeah. Small yeah. doses of pain are are good. Yeah. That's what a workout is. Yeah, small doses of pain. Right. If you're small going through depression, doses. that's not what we're talking yeah. about. Like this that that's a serious like point. the deliciousness of something really hot. It's just not gonna burn you, but there's something about wow, that is I, I feel the sensations. So I'm I'm with you on it. Yeah. We gotta embrace some pain. Uh so let's let's get back to that. The well, set uh, is getting old. Yeah. We're um, starting to wear the set. It happens to your skin too and your hair. Oh. Everything. Body parts. Soon you and the set will be one. Marshall's preserves. <laughs> Marshall's preserves. I am well preserved. <laughs> okay, what about let's go to some positive things. We were talking about habits to avoid and uh bad things to expect. Yeah. What sets the sets apart the ones that make it, that become professionals? There is one major one. It's just like the habits to avoid. There's one major one is don't get discouraged because it takes a long time. Same thing with the, uh, the habits to embrace is that the ones who make it and the ones who get good, in my observation, are the ones who love it. 
the ones who just want to yeah. do it. The ones who feel like things that are encroaching on their studio time or their drawing time are encroaching, that this is what I want to do. If it's an obligation, eventually you say, I'm so glad I'm free of that obligation. It's the art school burnout thing that we talked about. You get out of art school and you just say, I never want to sit in my studio again. Uh, if you're enjoying it and if you're an introvert, it's usually easier. If you're an extrovert and you've got friends that enjoy it too and it becomes a thing that you do together, there are some great extroverted artists who like to draw with their friends and, and comment on it. But I don't know of anything more important than that. Yes. There's a lot of ways to keep that love. One is to make sure, we've already mentioned this, to make sure that you don't just do exercises all the time. Mm -hmm. Set aside time to just work on your own fun projects, things that you would do, and then apply things you're learning to those projects. Yes. You're learning about how to draw a cube? Well, draw something that has a lot of cubes in it, mm -hmm. something fun. You're into Minecraft? Do that. You're into freaking warehouses warehouses <laughs> do that you're into uh gelatinous cubes from D &D. marshall's preserves <laughs> draw some, that, so you're into robots hey. draw some robots. whatever find some figure out what you like to draw and put some of that in it the point is don't just do exercises create your own fun projects so that's one thing is is keep it fun actually fun for yourself the other one is community you yeah. just mentioned friends yeah i think that's very important you guys listening to this are doing this online. You know, there is the comment section, but you're not seeing these people. If you can still find friends in your area, groups you could join where you could hang out and have people that are trying to do the same thing as you, um, because that makes it more fun. We are humans and we like to connect with other humans, yeah. right? The adding some emotion into it some relationships makes it more real mm -hmm. if our relationships with some people are built around this thing that we're doing it becomes a much stronger part of our life yeah the social bond as well as the the love of the work mm -hmm. putting the two together yeah and you can help each other out you can all take different courses and talk about them mm -hmm. bring them to you know, and show each other what you're doing. Stan, yeah. I've, I've got a, my, my little group of 12 per perspective students, 12 perspective students for, for six months. I've never where taught. Where is this? It's online. And they're international. On your, on they're, your website? Or is this? Where uh, no, no, no. This, this took me two years to find these students. I'll tell you about that in another Oh, it's podcast. just like a private mentorship type yeah, of deal. Yeah, yeah. Got 12 students. We're meeting once a week uh, to give feedback on work. And part of it is to design your own exercises. And one of them, uh, Jeff Arsenault, uh, did these reveries where he'd do little scribbles and then turn them into a bunch of tumbling cubes. And, you know, he learned how to draw cubes first, but then he did these things that are, they're exciting little exercises that actually kind of turn into a product. They're a cool little drawing. So that's along the lines of we're with friends, we're doing stuff, we're showing it to each other. And you find, I mentioned to him, you, you tend to find your talent by playing around. Uh, by seeing what I like to do, what my impulses uh, go with. So if you've got, you, you have a, a community of people that when they take the basics course, they can come together and share their work with each other? Well, online. Yes. Online, right. Yeah. There, I mean, Proko.com has a whole community section and under every lesson there's discussions and I encourage you guys to actually participate in that because those people are actually going through the same lessons as you. Yes, do that. Participate in the online community, but more than that, I think the in-person relationships are also important. I do too. And I don't, I'm not trying to replace that for people mm -hmm. on my website. Like you find your way to make those relationships in your life, wherever that is. It's going to be different for everybody. It depends on where you live, yeah. what's available to you. Yeah. Just make that effort. But sometimes online uh, relationships do replace it. Some people yeah. just, yeah, it works out that way. Yeah, it could. It's do harder, you but yeah. Oh, I do have another suggestion. Yeah. This don't work entirely digital. I mean, they're not going to. Good. I'm going to change it up. Good. Most of the course is in that sketchbook right there. Good. I will change it up. I'm going right. to do some digital because I want to show people that these fundamental things you're learning, 
are not tied to any medium. Right. You can do the exact same thing on a tablet with Procreate or any program. You can do mm -hmm. an Infinite Painter or Photoshop. It doesn't matter. You could do it in a sketchbook. You can do it on a pad of newsprint. Mm -hmm. I learned it mostly on newsprint, but sketchbook is great because it could fit in your backpack. I recommend that. Yeah. Why do you say don't do it entirely digitally? For what we've talked about before is that to go from digital to actually drawing on a surface that is an analog surface uh, is impossible for some young people. For some people, all they've done is digital. Whereas going the other way around is possible. And so I do it think It is hard both. though still. Still hard. It's hard because I trained purely traditionally. Yeah. And then when I was tr making that jump into digital, it was hard. Yeah. There were, I mean, there were differences. A lot of the muscle there memory are. I learned was being challenged. Should do both. Yes. Should do both. But m people don't incline to just do traditional anymore. Right? I mean, it, everybody is jumping on to Procreate and these marvelous programs that make everything look good mm -hmm. and neglecting that. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that is one thing I'd say as a, a cautionary tale. I want to see if I can balance it out with an encouraging and positive thing. Well, the, the positive thing there is that it's, an, it's enjoyable to step aside from your digital devices occasionally. Yeah. You know, you're already on your phone a lot. And then if you go from your phone to a tablet and then mm -hmm. to a computer, yeah. like you're just on a, looking at a screen all day. Being comfortable with a sketchbook, I think is a very positive thing. I do too. Even some other uh, things like just drawing on a, on a wall or a sidewalk and that kind of thing for the, to, to get out of, yeah. to, to, to be in touch with the fact that drawing is a tactile experience yeah and when you get good and people walk up to you and are like hey can you sign my my something something and you can write your and name and then you're like no i can you give me a tablet please yeah <laughs> it's, it's good to be able to use a pen on paper <laughs> broadens you yeah boy yeah well oh where, stay where healthy how don't neglect the human machine yeah their body your brain yeah keep it lubed look at stan for youth and vitality, <laughs> no. look at look at Skelly for nothing left, not yeah. even able, and then look at me for a nice compromise between the two. <laughs> so you're like an in between. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. This, yeah, he has no hair. I yeah. have some. Well, some... you've got a great head of hair. You're probably yeah, never going to go bald. You're in between. He's got no movement. <laughs> I have a lot, and you have. <laughs> So what I mean, is there, there's several things here. You, you, you got to move. Like, one bad habit people get into when they are artists is that they just sit all day. Mm -hmm. Something I did for a decade and that led to problems. Um, try to move, get up as much as possible. Um, if you don't have to be sitting for a specific task, then don't sit for that task. If you're just reading an article, you don't have to be sitting. You could be walking outside reading that article. Yes, you can. You can be on your phone and walking. And like cross the street and stuff too, right? I mean, when you're crossing the street, you could look up. <laughs> God, come on. <laughs> Jeez. Do you have a standing desk? I do, but it's in the low seated position. Okay, well, I got something I want to mention. This is dangerous. You, don't, you, I got you do it for like here. two months and then you sit down. What? I have felt this for a long time. I have, st I have stood to work a few times where I'll set up in my kitchen so that I can plug in the computer and do the work for an hour or two. And I, I found that I work better that way. In the last month, mm -hmm. working so much and sitting so much, I thought, I've got to do the infrastructure of setting up places. So I set up where I can actually teach by standing. It took a lot of work. And I've got another place where I can do the recording and do the editing and that kind of thing. And I can stand. And the last couple weeks, standing for an hour and even three and four hours a day to work has made me feel so much better. Makes me sleep better at night too. Yeah. They say sitting is the new smoking. And I started to realize yeah, I true. am sitting so much that it's starting to, as soon as I sit down five minutes into it, I say, your body doesn't like this. Uh, yeah, but I've only got an hour or two to do. And then I know, I know how I'm going to feel in an hour or two. You're going to regret. Yeah. So I just had to stop work for a few days and build some standing stations. But yeah. I really am big on that. Yeah. There's three main things. 
work out, diet, and sleep. Mm -hmm. And sitting. Not well, sitting. that's working out. I would say okay. move, movement, move yeah. your body, exercise. Hey, there's another thing creatively that happens with standing. I find that when I'm standing, I'll work on something and then I come up against a creative block and I didn't even do it. I didn't do it intentionally. I realized like a dog that start, you know, walks around before it, it, I'd pace around the room several times and then come back and get to it. And that became a part of the rhythm that it's not just standing. It's when you come up against a problem, there's a sense of, I got to change what's in my field of vision. And it was uh, certainly not planned. It was impulsive, but it works well. I even noticed that I always turn counterclockwise too. I don't know why. I mean, you know, it might be interesting to try. Well, next time you have a come up against a creative block and you say, I got to think about this, try turning clockwise, see how it goes. I don't know. You don't care about like stuff that. like that. It's too uh, psychological. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> might be interesting though. Yeah. I think n being unhealthy in those three things, diet, exercise, and sleep, leads to the mental problems that people kept calling in about during our podcast. Mm -hmm. Lacking confidence, uh, imposter syndrome, being too self-critical. Like when you're healthy, you will just be happier. You'll be more confident. Your hormones will be more balanced. Like all of that is better for being a better artist. It's indeed like you. Yeah. You'll be more self-critical if you're less confident. And if you're not happy with your health, that leads to a lot of problems. And then you think you're a bad artist too. Yeah. It all fits together and it all leads to bad things. Yeah. I remember so. decades ago reading creativity books and one of them, the first chapter was exercise and, and uh, take care of your health. I thought, kind of strange, creativity kind book that starts with that. But now I'm starting to see oh. where it's coming from. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to find, if we were to know what the stats were of how many people have called us and told us about their lack of motivation and all that kind of, how many of them, if we were to say, let's literally get at let's it. Analyze what do you, how what do you, you eat are. all day and, and how often do you exercise? And I think it would be, sleep. I think there'd be a correlation. It really is important. It is. So get up so right get now. Get up right now. Do you really get need up to be out of your sitting? chairs right now? Do you need to be sitting to listen to this? Yeah, I don't think you do. You do not. Stan's going into scolding mode. I watch Stan's YouTube going videos. Into the, the mean dad mode. It's he's been so kind with his kids that when he gets on camera and deals with you, he goes into the I'm gonna kick their butts mode. I am glad to see this. I want to encourage this. Stan the drill sergeant. Okay. This is what we've been paying for. Let's go for yes. it. Yes. We'll dress you up in a, as a drill sergeant. Are are you not gonna comment that I just stood up? Oh. <laughs> what did I miss? He stood up. Charlie, that's I great. do need to be sitting right now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Stuck. If well, I we, stand we up, did a draftman podcast where we stood most of the time. We did. Yeah. What? Do you not remember? Which one was that? It was at the Getty Museum. Oh, it was yeah. our least uh, watched podcast, and you released it for me. It's it because I was the one who insisted on it. And I, I've, I've told students, you know, Stan's got a better sense of marketing than me. The, the ones that I insisted on, the ones that watched least, my students. That's said, not yeah. true. It's ever, it's, the least watched ones were the AI ones. Oh, and those were your idea. Those were my ideas, which is why we're going to do another AI episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was just a AI little early. One now you know? might be a big it hit. Was a little early. Boy, people the... are really, really at yeah. odds on, and, and I mean, it's it's like a, a cultural firestorm uh, because there's there's the legal and ethical issues. The question be, a lot of people ask is like, is it still worth to learn how to draw? Just very relevant to the, the, the students taking this class. And I think absolutely yes, because drawing or learning the visual language is more than what the AI does. It's just, it's a way we communicate. AI already knows how to write like we write. Does that mean that we shouldn't write? Like, no, we write because we communicate with words and we still want to say things. So, the I, same thing here. If you want to communicate with pictures, you could still do it. Sure, a computer can do it too. That doesn't mean you can't. You have something to say. Right. A say computer, it. A computer can speak now. Cool. Do you want to not speak? Cool. Anyway, thank you guys. I hope you enjoy that. And that we probably gave a lot, a lot of different things that they can go do now. Probably too much. <laughs> we gave a lot of different um, things. I hope they you took do. notes. Uh, yeah, go on to the next lesson. All right. Nice Practice. meeting you. Practice. And stand up. Maybe we should too. Let's. Yeah, let's stand it. up. Stretch our backs. There we, go. we are in good shape. Okay. Oh God, yeah. Now I feel the effects. 
I'm standing oh, up. I'm sitting so, so long. Oh.